her own. She has to have one trait from the father and one trait from the mother. Huh? Are we unknowingly spreading yeah, sickness? Well, yeah. Obviously what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is why we're doing the awareness we're, program. We're ignorant. Yeah, we're like ignorant of that. the fact. I'm a carrier myself. I found out in similar circumstances, like in the movie. And my partner's pregnant and found out then. But my partner's a carrier as well. So the question was posed, like, what did we want to do? I don't think that that was a reason to actually abort a child or anything like that. I wouldn't be doing that. But surely there's another way, one which might prevent such difficult decisions being forced on parents in the excitement of pregnancy. Preconception is the way to go, really, because then it means people are aware of their genotype before they actually conceive. And this will do that. This sort of session will also actually do that, because if you're encouraging people to go for testing, this actually could lead to preconception, because, you know, I'm assuming some of these young men are going to go on and con conceive. People go to the doctors every six months kind of thing to get a little check-up to make sure that we don't have no AIDS, no chlamydia, hepatitis, etc, etc. Why couldn't they just take another test for the sickle cell as well? Do you know what I mean? Like kill two birds with one stone. Shouldn't the NHS offer to test everyone long before they conceive so they can have many more choices? They could then opt for PGD or choose sickle-free partners as well as abortion. In Nottingham, GP Nadim Qureshi is already ahead of the game. In offering preconception testing to all his patients. Like in this practice, as soon as a patient registers, they're offered the sickle cell and thalassemia screening test. And what's, what's the shortcoming of how the NHS deals with it at the moment? It's not thought about it at all. We're at a point where we're developing the technology. It's a bit like a, you've got yourself a customised car, a car that just goes for a Frankfurt motor show. But no one's thought, how do you go from that to the car that's out on the street? And so what should GPs be doing about sickle cell? Well, sickle cell, at the moment, there's a national screening programme for sickle cell, which is at the antenatal stage. Talking to patients, they're asking, why can't this be offered pre-pregnancy? And the only setting where pre-pregnancy sickle cell screening can take place is in the primary care setting. And in that way, they don't have to worry as soon as they get pregnant, oh, am I at risk? They've already thought through the process. Am I at risk of sickle cell? If I'm at risk, what options are open to me? So should the NHS be offering much more screening for genetic conditions? Should we all be tested for everything? I've come to the NHS body who make these decisions, the National Screening Committee. Their director is Anne Mackey. To test for the genetic conditions on the individual thoughts of a GP means that they might be offering tests which are not accurate, um, are highly likely to give false positives, um, that a positive test doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually going to get the disease. There are all sorts of reasons why just saying I think I should offer these greater range of tests isn't a good idea. If, if I'm a GP and somebody comes into my surgery um, asking for um, advice about family planning, and I'm in an at-risk group for sickle cell, for example, your advice would be that no discussion about hereditary disease happens. Um, if people want to find that out, then that's up to them. It's back to this business of if, if you're the patient and you come along and say, I want to know some of these things, then that's... But if you're going to find out about fertility and you don't know anything about sickle cell, yep. then it's not the GP's job to say, did you know there's a disease that you might be at risk of? And we have well, a we, test we, for we it. Haven't, we haven't 
um, either recommended or rolled out a program that says in GP should be offering um, information like that to everybody who comes in these circumstances, no, but we're actively looking at whether we should do that and, and how feasible that is. The ethics are so different. If a person wants something for themselves, um, there's, a, there's a conversation about whether that's helpful to them or not or whether they really understand what it is, but that's quite different from us offering something that they've never heard of or ne never worried about before because we know that we will do some people harm, we will give some people the wrong result. I hope that these considerations bear fruit soon, because although we might not want the NHS to systematically test each of us for every risk, surely it's the role of doctors to warn us all of our genetic possibilities, and then we can make the decisions. That's what I did, and my results are now in. Yesterday was the anniversary of my mother's death. She died a year ago. And today I'm going to find out about whether or not I have a cancer gene. And actually, I'm really worried about it. I'm, um, I don't know how I'll be able to deal with it if they tell me that I have this gene. your folder, so I suppose I should. The result is good news. Right. And that we did not find one of those gene mutations. No yes. mutations detected? Yeah. Not in those three mutations that we've looked at. Right. You know, does it change my risk for, for developing cancer at some point? From what we've got here, yes, your, your risk of cancer because of your family history possibly is still a bit higher than other people because you've still got a family history that's unexplained. But we can't say from the testing we've done that it's higher than perhaps you thought it was to start with. It may be a bit lower than perhaps you thought it was to start with. But yes, it doesn't answer all the questions in your family. It's kind of weird that, um, that when I set out on this, I wanted some kind of certainty and it's, and it's, and it's weird that the good news that I haven't got this gene is somehow almost a bit more frustrating than the bad news at it because there's still a spectre out there. I just, you know, modern science hasn't been able to identify it and oh, I just don't know what it is. Even if we had found a gene mutation in you, there still wouldn't have been certainty. You still yeah. wouldn't have known if you were going to get cancer, when you might get cancer, or how, how it might happen. This. Testing can only answer some of the questions. It doesn't answer all of the questions. It's a relief not to have the bad gene. And I'm glad I was tested and availed myself of the choices in this new era of genetics. But for others, the benefits are even greater. Nine and a half weeks. Tracy is in the final weeks of pregnancy, further along than she's ever been before. I was very happy when I found out it was a boy. Yes, yeah. everybody around the scan area knew. <laughs> Deep down, I kind of wanted a little girl. <laughs> As every woman wants, they always want a little girl. But I'm happy that we've got a boy in it. I think it's going to be strange, especially bringing him home, sort of because deep down I still miss the boys and that. These uh, little booties were actually left over from when we had twins, sort of, we bought them and then. Yeah. Never going to be used, but... But we didn't want to get rid of them, so we kept them. If it wasn't PGD, we wouldn't be this far along now. Or, or even be pregnant at all. Mm. We'd uh, probably be looking at a life of either adopting or... Just not having children. Obviously, after Carl's been born, we will get him tested to find out if he does have it. Hopefully he doesn't. I'll be very, very happy if he doesn't have it. It'll be nice to make sure that stops with me. It's not going to continue. It's going to stop here. The new wave of genetic knowledge has transformed Tracy and Thomas's lives. And there seems to be no limit to the information that could benefit us all. I've just had a message from California. The subject line of this email is, your genetic profile is ready. Well, I'm going to click on my health results. There you go. Yes, I want to view my results. It confirms I haven't got a breast cancer gene. Familial hypercholesteremia, type B, haven't got. 
and a whole collection of others that I've never heard of. Elevated risks. Atrial fibrillation. Adam Wishart, 47 out of 100 men of European ethnicity who share Adam's genotype will develop atrial fibrillation between the ages of 0 and 79. Whereas in general, only 27 out of 100 of men of European ethnicity will develop it. So it says atrial fibrillation is characterized by chaotic electric signals in the heart that can cause the upper chambers, the atria, to quiver. And whilst it's not usually life threatening on its own, it can have deadly complications. I feel really uncomfortable that at some point in the future I might have get arrhythmia of the heart or whatever it is. Well, I mean, I asked for it. I chose to go down this line and the company provides me with the information that I asked for. I mean, I do think I was a bit foolish in asking for it, since I've got no way of dealing with how to, you know, what it says. So I'm gonna go and try and speak to some of the guys about what all this means. There's another genetic counsellor who knows all about these DIY tests. I got the results, and apart from anything else, I'm a bit worried because it says that I've got roughly a 50-50 chance of having atrial fibrillation, whatever yeah. that is, yeah. which seems to me to say that I'm going to die of a heart disease in the not-too-distant future. What's important to do is to put this into context. This gives the risk of a person with your genetic variation get atrial fibrillation between the ages of 75 and 79. And what it's really saying is that most of the risk, extra risk you have, is between after the age of 75. And all of us are going to get some kind of disease as we get older. It's a fact of life. And so have you ever done this? No, I never would. I only want to find out things about myself that are useful and that I can do something about. I don't want to find things out that I'll just worry about. So I suppose my question back to you is, what have you gained by finding out this information? Well, I guess partly naively, I hope that it would tell me something about how I was in at maximum good health and that I wasn't going to get, get anything ever. Yes. yes. And now that I've got a 50-50 chance of having atrial fibrillation, um, I've just learned worry, I think. That's, yeah. you know. I mean, you strike me as somebody that worries about their health anyway. <laughs> <laughs> In the course of making this programme, I've caught hypochondria. <laughs> yes. Of course, I am relieved that the secrets of my blood don't foretell a terrible destiny. Even if that means I still don't know whether there was a genetic element in my mother's breast cancer. But one thing I've learned is that whilst the NHS is brilliant at delivering, this immense new power to heal. It's better at serving the lucky few. But there are the many who are at risk from serious diseases that are easily detectable and managed if only they knew. The tragedy is that thousands of people could be saved from suffering and precious resources. The cost of their care could be redirected to other patients in need.